Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Um, to all of those of you I haven't seen already this year, Happy New Year. Um, to all of those of you who've come from the United States, welcome. We're delighted you were able to make it. We're delighted you were able to fly out and, uh, and join us, despite the horrendous weather over there. Um, to everyone from NYU, welcome. This is, I think, the... 11th or 12th year of the collaboration between Shakespeare and Company and NYU. However many years it is, it's certainly more than any of us. The 11th, okay. <laughs> more than any of us uh, care to really count, I think, by this point. Um, makes us all feel terribly old. Um, we're lucky to be able to kick off uh, this week of readings with the wonderful Nathan Englander. Um, while significant sections of Nathan Englander's second novel take place in Paris, Berlin and Capri, it soon becomes clear that it is cent its centre of gravity is the strip of land that one character almost dismisses as the armpit of the Levant, but that another declares one of the most beautiful and varied places on earth. Transporting readers from the Gaza border to Jerusalem to a hospital in Tel Aviv and to a black site in the, in the Negev desert, while also hopping back and forth between 2002 and 2014, in a narrative that doesn't so much arc as kaleidoscope, Dinner at the Centre of the Earth is a captivating spy thriller, a story of love, of politics and of betrayal in its myriad forms. It's also, however, a state of the nation novel, or perhaps better, a state of two nations novel, an attempt to represent and in representing understand the human forces that not only allow the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to endure, but which might also bring it to an end. In short, Dinner at the Centre of the Earth is quite the literary high-wire act that Nathan Englander pulls off by drawing upon his vibrant imagination, his stylistic agility, his depth of feeling, as well as his penchant for the absurd, the very qualities that have won him so many loyal readers over the years. In addition to Dinner at the Centre of the Earth, Nathan Englander is also the author of the internationally best-selling story collections For the Relief of Unbearable Urges and What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, and the novel The Ministry of Special Cases. His work has been translated into 22 languages, and he's been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Penn Malmood Award, the Frank O'Connor Award, the Sue Kaufman Prize, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and was a finalist for the Perlitzer Prize. Julian Barnes called Dinner at the Centre of the Earth a subtle, nuanced, fierce novel, while Colson Whitehead declared it superb, adding that it was a work of psychological precision and moral force. Please join me in welcoming Nathan Englander to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Um, I guess where I'd like to start our conversation about Dinner at the Centre of the Earth is in a slightly unusual place, which is something you say in the acknowledgements yeah. um, right at the very end, when you're, um, when you're thanking uh, your agent, uh, Nicola Raggi, and you say, who read this book when it was still hidden inside another. Um, and I thought that was a very intriguing phrase, and um, I'm just curious to find out a little bit more about the genesis of the book. Oh, uh, I always like, I, and then I back up to like second grade. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm glad you asked this question because the first part of your, and thank you so much for doing this. It's so, it's so good. Anyway, I'm always nervous before an event, but it's always good when you know you're in excellent hands, but there's more homework in that introduction. Like, thank you for even building that. I was like, that is a close read just to build the hello. <laughs> um, but oh yeah as for that I have a lot of students here hello students but uh, everything you said about the structure of the book is everything I tell them like you're not allowed to do <laughs> any of this you know so I'm glad that you uh, bring us to the book inside the book yeah uh, I guess um, I have been wanting to write this book for literally you know near 20 years since the peace process fell apart I was living in Jerusalem I had moved there for the peace and Intifada 2 just broke my heart you know like just watching everything everybody had built burn down and I really I you know I feel like I'm sort of melted you know like that I'm frozen in time like I don't care talking to you today the notion of peace seems utterly impossible and stupid and a crazy thing to believe in it is really a two-state solution especially this month seems like the most impossible thing like that's how time moves it wasn't it was right there and as we're seeing you know back in America now as I saw in Israel it takes good people with good energy can build extraordinarily wonderful things in the world and it takes so few people to burn the whole fucking thing down you know what i'm saying we're watching our country be burnt down in the states it takes so i watched maybe 10 guys on you know five israelis five palestinians dismantle mm -hmm. middle east peace so i've been wanting to tell the story for 20 years another thing relevant from time is when i started to build this book there was a concept in america i didn't want to mansplain or lecture or give you my diary and also uh we used to have this in america if you weren't expert in something you would think i'm not expert i probably shouldn't weigh in on mm -hmm. middle east peace but now i should like head nasa or the department <laughs> of education but it, 
last year it used to be a thing. You'd say, I'm not a brain surgeon. I should not yeah. do brain surgery. Now you're like, oh, well, wash my hands. Mm-hmm. S- scrub me in. I'm ready. Anyway, but uh, to that point, I waited near 20. I wanted to tell this book so badly, and I've never tell this story so badly, but I really, really just, it's, it's about two realities. I wanted people to engage with a subject to like read this book not for the books like I just care about peace and there's no one who's going to pick up a book about Israel or Palestine that doesn't have preconceived notions Mm -hmm. like fierce preconceived notions and as we see again uh, to quote this one rabbi that I grew up with who literally made me not religious he was so (laughs) religious but one thing I did learn from that I like he'd say anyone more religious than me is a fanatic which is everyone thinks they're in the center no one thinks they're a maniac Mm -hmm. point is everyone comes to this subject uh, locked and loaded we shouldn't use gun metaphors Americans Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But I, yes, yeah, so I really had to find a structure for this book. I just wanted people to mm-hmm. sit down and read and to, like John Gardner, who I love, I bet there's an on moral fiction here or something like that. But he sees fiction and I, it, it really affected me as a place to reflect, to test your values. You mm-hmm. should go into a book and just think. I just wanted people to think about Israel, Palestine. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I wanted people to turn pages and have it hung on a story. And in answer to your question of 46 minutes ago, um, <laughs> Just, yes, I have the 500-page version of this book and a 600-page version of this book. When I finish, I cut it in half like a game of Jenga. I took out everything that the book didn't need to stay together Mm -hmm. because I just wanted to stay with the story inside. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that you, um, I mean, because in in a sense, as you say, everyone comes to it with their preconceived notions. And I think the way that you manage to sort of uh, avoid uh, sort of coming clashing head on with those preconceived notions is by rooting it in the character studies in the in the human stories so these are not um, even though I think you know I wouldn't say any of your characters are particularly ordinary people they're all in one way or another invested in uh, in the conflict and in in the state we don't necessarily engage with them as or all of them as sort of overtly political beings. We, we meet them first as as people. And so I was just wondering, is um, was was that a sort of a conscious decision on your part to to sort of avoid that sort of head-on collision to oh, uh, to uh, rest with the characters? Uh, gigantically so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just I'll just keep saying that. I'll just rate all your questions. Thank you. Excellent question. <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, no, like so. Gig- I've never written a book. You, books all come from different places. Sometimes you know the end. Sometimes you know the beginning. I didn't know the end of this book. Uh, I call it executing the inexecutable. I like to write a book that I can't figure out how to get to. That's what keeps me not bored in my room. Is like there's no way to get to this end and have mm-hmm. it function. There's literally no way to get to this end book of this book and have it function. But I've never thought of structure so much. Mm-hmm. As I said, I just wanted to work this whole book builds around limbo and neutral mm-hmm. spaces and the Jewish concept of Sheol we took Christ, uh, from uh, heaven and hell from Christianity we didn't have it anyway <laughs> but um, you know like there was just limbo spaces I'm interested mm-hmm. in limbo spaces and yeah it just became so clear to me that the only way to tell this as a, yeah, as a neutral again everyone can have their feelings and be mm-hmm. radically political in the book but as I said yeah it just through character and through mm. story, so I'm glad if it reads that way, but I worked so hard to build it that mm. way, that it's just the them of the story. And was it difficult to avoid the characters becoming ciphers for political ideas? Yeah, uh, it was really... So there's two like two of the very central characters in this book, and again, I feel so bad. My uh, The one present, I say, for 20 years of support to Knopf, my publishers, I finally gave them you know a book that's not about a rabbi eating toast. It has a <laughs> plot. You know, like, they deserve that much. But I do feel bad for my editor. There's no way. There's literally maybe like seven timelines and five mm-hmm. genres and 13 threads going. <laughs> there's no way to, sum- to write jacket copy for this book that doesn't mm-hmm. sound like a telenovela. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, Prisoner X is, Prisoner Z has disappeared. The general's in a coma. You know, it's like... Uh, uh, you know, bizarrely, bizarrely, bizarrely structured that way. And uh, yeah, I can go on for yeah nine hours. I'll just. <laughs> we, but but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll just trail off there because there's about nine, nine, 19 more minutes for well, this. You, you oh, so the overtly political prisoner Z <laughs> is uh, prisoner Z. Uh, I didn't drink wine before. This is the jet lag, not the alcoholism. <laughs> um, but uh, oh, Prisoner Z is uh, there was a so there's the real life characters that one uses as a template. Mm-hmm. My last book tour, I was on the way to the airport from Jerusalem uh, back to you know fly home. JFK was functioning at the time. <laughs> anyway, but uh, you know on the front page of the newspaper was the story of Prisoner X, who was a guy so much like me, about my vintage. You know, he was Australian, I was a Yankee. Mm-hmm. Like he was maybe more Zionist raised, I was more Bible raised but he had moved to Israel he had 
you know, I thought about what this is. He'd moved to another country. He'd adopted that country's ideology. Mm -hmm. Like, he was so diehard, he became a spy for its vaunted and terrifying Mossad, you know, spy service. He'd done deep cover, which is absolutely terrifying to me. And then he'd become a traitor, right? Mm -hmm. That's He's on the front page of the paper. Thank you to Kafka, because that saves 40 minutes. I can say Kafka-esque and not try to explain what that <laughs> means. But the point is, Prisoner X was on the cover of the paper because he'd hung himself in his cell. The only thing is, until the moment of dying, Prisoner X had never lived. And until the moment of hanging, there was no cell from whence to hang himself mm -hmm. because no cell had existed and there was no person in it. So only at the point of death by hanging, there became a person and then a cell because this guy had become a traitor. You know what I'm saying? He'd become a traitor to his adopted country. And I thought about ideology. I'm obsessed right now with empathy because it's disappearing like the turtle. Anyway, but, uh, you know, I just thought about what it takes to flip someone. I love those. Sp I love the real spy stories and I love the TV movies and the books. I love flipped spies. It fascinates me. Mm -hmm. And we know why people flip. It's always failure of character, personality disorder, blackmail, passed over for a promotion, you want to be president. We know why people mm -hmm. collude mm -hmm. with foreign powers. And I thought, what would it take to flip someone through empathy? Like, what would it take a prisoner X who's adopted a country and ideology become a spy deep cover and then he becomes a traitor? I was like, you join the Mossad and then become a traitor? I thought, what would it take for that to happen through feeling for the other side? And that's the moment for me that an X becomes a Z. Like, that's how characters from the world flip. And on the opposite end of that spectrum in this book is the general, mm -hmm. who is so many things of his life match Ariel Sharon's life. And that, to me, is not a template. You know, you should base nothing on Sharon. And that's because even I, as a writer, and I think any reader, you can't read him you cannot enter into even a fictionalized version of himself and shift. Mm -hmm. Because the people who love him, love him for his warring and his fighting and all the times he saved Israel mm -hmm. and all his great battles and all his killing. And the people who hate him, hate him for all his fighting and the Kibya massacre and Sabrin Shatila. He is so loaded. So I can tell you, Prisoner X became Prisoner Z, mm -hmm. but Sharon can't be a version of Sharon. Mm -hmm. I have my general because I needed to own the person. Mm -hmm. So depending on their politics, you know, they could be themselves or not. Mm -hmm. You know, Omer is Omer, Ben Gurion is Ben Gurion. Um, and was it as a um was it for you because there, there are some of the characters are specifically named so we have yeah. prisoner Z and we have the general but then we have for example uh, Ruthie who's yeah. looking after the general yeah, yeah. and we have um, uh, Farid what? yeah 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 um, and thanks for no spoil I've never had spoilers before it's so fun to have spoilers I'm like no spoilers <laughs> and, and for, but for example we can understand maybe how um, prisoner Z uh, could be seen as sort of a, a both a symbolic character and as a a real life char character, but there's also, for example, the waitress who yeah, yeah. who goes unnamed as well. So I was just wondering, how did you? What was the the guiding principle in? who got names and who didn't yeah so i think you have to it's just a contract with the reader like i just it was just cl there's the i mean you can always say i can tell you consciously here because a uh, subconscious reading is it may be more fun but it's <laughs> super strange like there's the conscious decisions and then the gut decisions when you build a book so i just knew they didn't have names but I didn't know until I built it why and that's because everything in this book is a doubling because that's the Israel-Palestine conflict and we can or I'll tell you about reality the thing that obsessed me in Israel which we now have in America was the dual realities there's a Hebrew concept of the opposite of the opposite and that's how Israel functions and I can't understand it took me years there to learn that I was like everyone's trying to broker this peace process between Israel and Palestine it's not a spectrum it's not like you believe in school vouchers and I don't or you believe in health care and I let's you're wrong if you don't believe in giving people health care but you you have a side of a position you know what i'm saying it's wrong there is right and wrong i don't care it's still left you're just wrong children get health care <laughs> anyway but i'm saying those are spectrums on a position but it took me i saw everyone with a lot of goodwill you know egypt and america and saudi like yes people want to park their aircraft carriers and stuff like that but there's still goodwill in trying to broker this piece and it took me years of living there to understand you're not it's not a disagreement. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's talking as if there's two sides. There aren't two sides. Mm -hmm. There are like two different realities. You know what I'm saying? Like I, it took me years to say, oh, I'm living in Jerusalem and my holy site is the Temple Mount and my Palestinian neighbor in the same city, same street, breathing the same air, lives in Il Quds and her holy site is Haram al Sharif. Mm -hmm. Same spot, like it's dual realities. I'm not kidding and it's not a joke. And my American example of that is right now I could put up, you know, two pictures of two inaugurations with two crowds and well me, I'm not talking about the liars 
and the disseminators. I'm talking about good people still. Sasha's like, no, none of them good. But nonetheless, <laughs> respect when Sasha's in the room. But nonetheless, s people will, will all look and the room will split. This one like 90-10, but nonetheless, we'll split and they'll say, the photo with less people has more people. Like to see that is mm. to be in a different reality. We have, now have it in America and it's so dangerous, mm -hmm. which is dual realities, two sets of news, two news streams. Mm. So that's the split and that is for me what obsessed me in trying to bridge that and that takes, that takes an allegory and that's the point. This mm -hmm. book starts as a spy story and then becomes a magic realist coma <laughs> dream history of Israel and then becomes a love story but in the end the book is truly an mm. allegory and I think those names signal the subconscious of the reader at the front. Mm -hmm. to prepare you you can't just drop an allegory on someone mm -hmm. it's not right <laughs> and, and that concept of those two realities I guess leads us to the idea of, uh, of limbo yes which you talked about earlier it's almost like when you have two when you're sort of split between two uh, opposing poles yeah, yeah. you're going to find yourself in this uh, yeah in this, in this situation where you, you can't go one way or the other yes. in a sense so could you just elaborate a little bit on your your interest in this oh, back to the book within the book uh, one has to learn write those chapters over and then cut them out you're like I'm so sorry Sorry, there aren't five chapters about the Witch of Endor set in biblical times. I have that draft for you. <laughs> anyway, but like back to heaven and hell, like, you know, I just love that, you know, how history changes. Like, it's not part of Judaism anymore, but it's in the Bible. Like, you open, you know, I guess it's Kings 2, maybe, and I'll get it wrong. It's Saul talking to Samuel, but he needs some. God stopped talking to him. He needs some advice. So he's like, God's not talking to me. I need some advice. I know. And he's the one who's banned back to politics. He is banned black magic in the country no magic no talking to spirits he's the one who's banned it the the king you mm -hmm. know but then he puts on a cloak and literally he, they've heard there's the witch of Endor and she literally is like you're not ratting me out he shows up to her surprised and he says I need to talk to someone mm -hmm. and he musters Samuel I think it's so bad if I have my kings <laughs> wrong but nonetheless he gets his advice and then she gets mad when she see who she's mustered but I love this notion that that as someone who grew up religious, my whole driving force of my life, what uh, all these nice, there's so many people here who deal and wrestle with my anxiety and keep me standing up in this room. <laughs> Thank you all for talking to me. So much of it is for growing up in a black and white world and then seeing that the world is gray. Mm -hmm. There's a gray space. And I, you know, that's what makes me pull my hair out in the States right now. You know, like, everything is gray this idea of absolutism and I, nothing is scarier to me than anyone who's sure you know what i'm saying i always say that to the students you can all make it except the one of you who's sure you're going to be a writer mm -hmm. like you're you're cooked mm -hmm. you know <laughs> but anyway so yeah this great i love that that space is part of israel's history that mm -hmm. souls were just around that there's something in between and that to me really is a metaphor for everything this opposite there has to be a space between Il Quds and Jerusalem, between Haram al Sharif and the Temple Mount, between Israel and Palestine, mm -hmm. between, you know, greater Israel is everything from the sea, you know, like all the way to Amman and, you know, for Hamas, that, you know, Palestine is everything. Like, there has to be a place where we don't all kill each other. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I look for it in my day to day, and I was, and Israel to me, there's no greater metaphor of a place that needs to find mm -hmm. its middle. And Definitely in the book, it feels like um, a quest on the part of the author, actually. It feels um, like in... in the, you said sort of you were joking, but you said like sort of five different genres and thirteen different timelines and things like that. But it feels that that kind of gave you the opportunity to explore, uh, not as I said, not only to understand what's going on, but also to explore potential ways through the... or ways out of limbo, perhaps. Yeah, I, well, I guess... You know, uh, back to having fun writing, every book better be your first book, and every book you better roll up your sleeves and be like, now I'm ready to write. You know, we were also talking about getting old in your bodies. Like, I can't go to the Olympics now. I can't be like, I'm going to be a gymnast. Like, this stuff will snap off, you know? <laughs> Even if I dream it and really dig, it's, you know, mm -hmm. but... When I started writing, I owe so much to Marilyn Robinson, who like really taught me, you know, I'd write a sentence, and I just remember, she'd say, like, I'm sure I've said it in this room on tape here before <laughs> exactly like this. It's my <laughs> writing brain and writing self. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she, I literally showed up at Iowa like this newly secular kid with, from a religious sort of like, you know, English, even though we're so American, but all my teachers, you know, I'd say like, I should wait here all day for you to show up at 5.30 when we said we meet up two o'clock, that's a friend, you know, and Marilyn would say like, uh, uh, yes, there's all the information of a sentence is in here, it's just in Yiddish <laughs> and backwards, you know, but I learned that I think in circles on a sentence level, that's always how I'll think, and that I would write in circles, everything had this circular st structure, and to communicate, 
Reader, writer to reader is enacted as a shared consciousness. It is the world falling the way. It's minds coming together. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to tell a story that we can follow A to B. And I spent, mm -hmm. I really remember getting so frustrated in grad school and writing a story and being like, is this what you all want? And everyone's like, yes. And then I had a career. You know, literally that. <laughs> I was like, is this what you guys want to see? And they were all like, yes, literally exactly that. <laughs> like anyone can do that, you know. But for I waited for 20 years. I was tamping down my circles. But what makes me crazy is history repeating itself mm -hmm. and that's why Gaza and the Gaza Wars go home and put it in Wik Wikipedia put in Gaza War they have names like Fast and Furious movies mm -hmm. you know Cast Lead Grapes of Wrath and I want you to know right now and by the way based on your politics pretend I picked whichever side you want first I'm talking about <laughs> who started but nonetheless right now Hamas is digging tunnels that are getting blown up building better rockets working on better reach for the next war the next Gaza War they're readying and Israel is now building a wall underground there's a wall already above ground in Gaza, they're building a wall underground, and as someone who likes language, there is no such thing as a wall. That Walls go up by definition. I don't even know what a down wall is. There's no word for it. Nonetheless, but Israel doesn't even plan for the next war. It's called the, like, strategic term is called mowing the lawn. They plan for two wars ahead, which is when we're going in there, we can also hit the targets that are going to slow, you know, Hamas down and Islamic Jihad down for the war after the war. You know what I'm saying? That's how cynical it all is. Everyone's always building. You know, they're not both sides plotting for war and the war after the war. It is unacceptable to me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, this, I got, uh, it was Harvard Bookstore. They will give you the business during Q&A in Harvard Bookstore. But I said, I've worked so hard to not take any position in this book, just mm -hmm. to tell a story, just to have a place. And this woman, she just wouldn't let go. She's like, you do have a position. And I was like, I have no mm -hmm. position. Like, it's both sides. That's all I tried to build. I can fail at it, but there is no. Mm -hmm. And she said, this book is pro-peace. It believes in peace. <laughs> and I said, thank I thought about it so much. I said, you know what? Back to me saying there's right and wrong. There, you don't, there is no position but peace. If your position is eternal war, that's not okay. And if your position is one side should win, there's like millions of Palestinians and millions of Israelis. One side winning is destruction. We've already seen, you know, we're in Paris. We have seen places run with blood. So I'm like, oh, I still take no position. The fact that the default belief is we should find a solution, like that is, you know, mm -hmm. Really, I don't understand, you know, that there could be any other way, you know. And I think one thing that it does as well, keeping it on a, on a very human scale as you do, is that it allows us sometimes to sort of, to, to overcome those ideas of, oh, it's, it's just too complicated, it's, it's more difficult than you imagine. There's, there's a line at, at a point where a character says, what if it were no more of an effort than waking oneself up from a dream? And I, I think that does seem to be one of the sort of unifying threads of a lot of your characters. Is this kind of, they seem to be asking... Why isn't this easier than it isn't? Why, when every, a lot of yeah. majority of people seem to be on the same page, there's something because it doesn't. Apart. When it doesn't serve people, and when there's when other when people in power, that's what makes me crazy. We have thirty thousand gun deaths in a year. By the way, do you know how many? Back to the violent Middle East. Do you know how many soldiers have died in Israel fighting mm. in all the wars since the start of wars? All of them. I mean, 48, 67, 73. Leb, everything. Add them all up. Every single buried Israeli soldier in like almost 100 years. Mm -hmm. I think it's 28,000, which is 2,000 less than our annual gun death. Lo like, mm -hmm. that is a plague. And the majority of people want it. We could end the gun plague tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Australia did. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that if you want... Thanks. No more. Yeah. I, I, anyway, but <laughs> but I'm saying that Israel. Everyone knows the maps. We drew the maps. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what it looks like. It could be done tomorrow. And I always use the example of sending a man to the moon. Mm -hmm. Like you know, with less, with, you have to adjust whether you have an iPhone six or an iPhone ten. But like with all the computing power of your phone, that's like ten thousand times. You know, mm -hmm. there's that wonderful Disney movie. Watch the mathematicians do math. But I'm saying using graph paper, like we sent someone to the moon. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to reach the moon. And to me, the great thing I understand I'm not an engineer I understand the slingshot part we brought them back you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying we, d we don't need self-driving cars we do stupid shit all the time <laughs> that takes infinite brain power mm -hmm. If you if people wanted this, they'd do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They could do it tomorrow. everybody knows what it's looked like. everybody knows what that final map looks like. And so yes, you know, I, I'm a crazy person for saying make peace tomorrow, but why not, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just spent a year living in Malawi, whole separate story, but uh, every once in a while I would go for electricity and decent wine, you know, like we had two weekends in South Africa, but like that idea to me, it just blew my mind to see post-apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. Like no one, I don't know if it's 90%, 
black in South Africa in 95, nobody needed to make peace mm -hmm. to, you know, flip that country. Like they, you know what I'm saying? It could have been much bloodier and much more violent and a lot more justice for some people who have not seen justice. And somebody, it takes leadership, it took a Mandela to say we're gonna make peace and people ride the bus every day to work and see their fucking torturer on the bus. Like it, it is so, that country blew my mind. You, I can't think of a situation more extreme, mm -hmm. you know, in my lifetime. I can't believe I lived through that, you know, but, uh, you know, then apartheid and that people chose peace. Like, if they can do it there, I don't see, I can't think of any country situation where, mm -hmm. you know, where violence would be more, you'd understand how it came to violence mm -hmm. to, to flip the government. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if people choose to do it, it is such bravery. That country makes me weep. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if they can do it there, everyone can do it. Mm -hmm. I think now Look, North Korea and South Korea, thanks to Trump, did do this. They are <laughs> meeting. <laughs> because, yeah. Should we hear a little extract from the book, give oh. people a taste of it? I mean, it's difficult, I think, yeah. to give a, an all-encompassing yeah, taste I because like, there's yeah. so many different voices, yeah. but I think it would be nice to hear That's fun. A you're, few you're uh, that, I'm so glad you asked. I happen to have reading glasses and a book with a page marked. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like a Tonight Show joke. I just happen to have one at the ready. Uh, anyway, but yes, as, as Adam just said, there's literally no way to set up a book like this but oh i will set up this part i i, <laughs> I uh oh just when you know a book's finished like this part of that prisoner z thing of wanting to explore prisoner z and uh i i made i spent maybe like years researching my argentina novel because it's set in 1976 in buenos aires you know, I was a baby when, when, the, when the dirty war happened. I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about the country. So I had to learn, like, how people, what kind of script, Felidiato script, like, what kind of script they used to do graffiti. What music you listen to if you're cool. What music you listen to if you're naughty. Mm -hmm. You know, Fido Paez, then Sumo. You know what I'm saying? You have to learn everything. For this book, the concepts were so gigantical mm -hmm. to me. I was like, I want to own my places. And that's why it's set here where I, there's a scene in this store. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's set in places where I live so I could own my world. Mm -hmm. And it became so personal like that spy is me it's a neurotic spy who calls his mother when he's in trouble because that's what <laughs> i would do if i were a spy but anyway but when the book was done i was like it's missing something my editor, we agreed and i just remembered i had written this down from like second grade i took this moment from my own you know sort of fictionalized second grade and i had to go s thank god for computers but searching random word fragments mm -hmm. but i think this may be the last thing that i added to the book that it's just so thinly veiled my uh strange education <laughs> How it had come to this, prisoner Z felt, had been set so very early, his Jerusalem, his Israel, his end. He'd been given it so long ago, back in suburbia, back in America, a birthright spoon-fed to him in his Jewish day school classroom, a little boy with a heavy prayer book and a yarmulke, like a soup bowl turned over and resting atop his head. It is second grade, and they are running, the children with their arms outspread. They are flying. The desks are pushed together, the teacher's orders, their lovely 18-year-old teacher who would soon get pregnant and disappear. They know enough, the boys and girls, to love this black-haired lady whose even more black, more beautiful hair peeks out from under her wig as she pushes the big desk, the teacher's desk, towards theirs. She dresses modestly, but there is no modest when you are a beautiful, raven-haired, 18-year-old second-grade teacher flushed from trying to get pregnant in all your free time. <laughs> Their love for her was different from what they felt for the others. It was marrying love and wanting to be her love, and it was youthful, energetic teacher love, and they would do anything for her, anything at all. So when after morning prayer, after marching into the room with their big green sidurum and taking their seats, when she'd stood and jutted out her bottom jaw and blown the hair from her eyes, when she'd said up, up, and raised her hands, raising the class so easily with them, prisoner Z's no longer sure if she'd actually spoken the up, up at all. We're going somewhere and we are late, is what she says. Where are we going, asked Bacha, whose English name is Beth. A smile from the teacher, a glimmer to the eye. We are going, my little Yiddelach, to Yerushalayim. We are flying right now to Israel. The Mashiach is coming and we need to get there. We need to help welcome him in. And the hands again are waving and we are all already following. Now push, push the desk together so we can get up into the sky. And when those desks are all together, a circle around the room, the teacher takes one of our tiny chairs, raising her skirt so we can see her ankle swathed in her scratchy gray tights. 
She places a foot on the seat of that chair and then climbs onto those child-sized desks. A teacher, a teacher standing on a desk. It is glorious. <laughs> she bends a bit at the knees and leans her head forward. The teacher then spreads her arms wide. She says, I am on an airplane. I am an airplane. We're all flying to Israel together to make Aliyah. We're headed to Jerusalem. We must hurry, hurry, a long flight, and the Messiah already on his way. And she takes off like that, flying from desk to desk around the room, tilting her beautiful covered arms in the turns. Come, she says, come. You do not want to be left in Gullus, forgotten in this Egypt. When the Messiah comes, our country awaits. And it is Roly Poly Bensi who is first up. And then Mayor Arye follows, flashing his monkey grin. There are Devora and Yocheved, Susan and Zev. And then I am on the chair. Prisoner Z feels himself rising. But with all those arms tilting and everyone running and howling and flying, I'm too afraid to join. And suddenly I am grabbed and suddenly I am lifted. The teacher has got me, she is holding me, and she sets me down in motion. And that is love and that is care. She holds on until my feet are moving and my arms spreading until I too, I feel it. Until I am looking down at the classroom below, down at New York, at America, until it all looks like desert and all looks like wasteland. Nothing but the emptiness that is the whole world outside what God gave us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to ask you one more question before opening it up to the audience. So if you have a question for Nathan, get ready and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, but just sort of bouncing off that, and there's a lot in this book that kind of the idea of a country compared to the reality of the country, the symbol of the country compared to what the country actually does. Um, there's a moment where Prisoner Z's actions are described as a crime of political passion, yeah. um, which I just sort of, which struck me as a, sort of caught me short, struck me as a very sort of interesting concept. And another moment where his actions are described as genuinely well-meant treason. Um, and yeah. obviously, uh, you know, treason is a word which is uh, very much uh, in, the, in the air at the moment. But I just yeah. wondered if... Because of treason. <laughs> because of... Because <laughs> of very obvious intentional <laughs> treason. Uh, but I just, I just wondered, could you just talk a little bit about that concept of sort of a, a crime of political passion or genuinely well-meant treason and what 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 you think sort of one owes to one's country to the the idea of one's country and when perhaps one has to sort of uh well that's it countries it. are an idea i mean that's why i can't sleep at night you know like it's just this idea i have an idea of what america is and this is a, not it you know and i just think about how much those a that people act in history America's so big, I never felt it. Like, I was always interested when friends were involved in American politics. In Jerusalem, I had a tiny little balcony, and it looked at the Knesset, and I'd know when bad stuff happened before it was on the news, because I'd see the helicopter land on the helipad, and then another kind of, like, oh, that's bad. You know what I'm saying? I'd see the prime minister's two cheesy, like, Lincoln Continentals, the real one and the, you know, distracto Lincoln, you know, pass by every... Like, it's just... I used to think it was Israel that woke me up to this, which is terrifying. I used to think people had a plan. I, I didn't think people were in charge of stuff. I said, oh, this seems a crazy thing for the prime minister to do. or the pre They must have a plan. Like, you wouldn't just go destabilize Iraq, like, you know, and lead to a Syria. Like, you wouldn't just undo the world. You must have a, there's something I don't, and like, I just, it was both terrifying and freeing to understand regular people make choices. And both that it's, it's, People need to act if they feel something wrong is going on. But but, but back to the idea of a country, uh, it's it's more as someone who was raised like Jerusalem is a living like Eretz Yisrael, like the religious thing. Abraham's from the Bible to me. Avram Avinu, like Moshe Rabbeinu, like those Moses, those Abrahams with their Hebrew names. Those are real living people to me. And that Jerusalem is a place. You know, my old gym there, I had a treadmill that looked at the old city walls, you know, and I was like, I just couldn't believe that mix of worlds. It was so shocking to me, you know, to split that up biblical Israel and actual Israel, biblical Jerusalem, actual Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, I remember it was a friend's mother, a Christian friend. I have like three. But anyway, <laughs> but she's super religious and was on pilgrimage. And I remember she like went to the Sea of Galilee where Jesus 
just like said her mom like flipped somebody was like water skiing like there is someone walking <laughs> on water they're just you know behind being yeah they're just fast you know but like that notion where I'm like that moment to me like Jesus walks this guy walks like on the Sea of Galilee you know and I said like that to me is the split and I can never let those ideas go of of what yeah what we think a place is and that's it you know I keep looking to my cynical friend but like this idea of what I had Ameri what I thought America was like you know and then you read and see oh it's always been this way you know I'd be very good at Jeopardy like I never I sort of know enough to be like what is teapot dome but I don't actually know what that's you know but I just didn't understand like stand how much now is just another cycle of extraordinary ruthless greed mm -hmm. you know but that we've been there before again and that's what our country has built that's why we're back to exceptionalism you know mm -hmm. we're you know really talented also we had you know slavery mm -hmm. On which note, um, it's over to you. If anyone has a question for Nathan, uh, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you so everybody can hear you. Please don't be shy. It's my favorite moment every <laughs> night. The, the pregnant question pops. Yeah, yes, stranger. Hi, Nathan. How are you? Hi, Tally Gumbin. Um, you, you mentioned two things that I would like to hear you talk about together. Your new fascination with empathy and then your immense, <laughs> not new, always, yeah, but yeah, you said you yeah. have a new no, no, but it's, uh, it's funny because it sounds like I have feelings now. I don't. No. <laughs> it's just an intellectual interest in empathy. <laughs> Sorry. You heartless person before yeah. your new fascination yeah, with empathy. Yeah. Um, your relationship with empathy, empathy and then and the idea that you have to do for certain pieces so much research and how you merge that and sort of develop empathy for things that you aren't for think for worlds that you've lived in and sides that you don't necessarily experience or worlds that you haven't lived in oh uh thank you for that we don't have to repeat there's a microphone but uh literally that's part of my craft talk on Wednesday, which is, this is, uh, I have such a Talmudic upbringing, I can never steal a joke, I never understand when anyone steals a joke, but this is a quote, and it's an E.L. Doctorow quote, but it's really an E.L. Doctorow quote, is quoted by Darren Strauss and messed up by me. But I like that notion where it's like, same if you're writing a PhD thesis, there's people, who, you can research till you die. You know, you could go on, you know, and the, the Doctorow quote is, you know, uh, yeah, only, you know, basically do the minimal amount of research to do your work. And I think that's like a really helpful notion. But, and this goes back to my teacher, Frank Conroy. I just believe in owning a world and it has to be, I, fictional realities to me are realities. They're just fictional realities. That is, it is another reality. It, you cannot be bumped. Somebody who lived, if you write about a fighter pilot, a fighter pilot has to read your book and say that's how it was. You cannot break that. Mm -hmm. But as Frank said, you know, if you need everyone to fly in your book, they can all fly. But if you hold their heads underwater, they have to drown. You can change what you need. Anything that a book needs to be true is true by virtue of its necessity. Anything else better be right. And I feel like that's the sweet spot of research. But if you get excited to write, I read about a paragraph of a book and then I start typing. I was like, that's enough. But yeah, I'm not, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, Anyway, yeah, I really feel like you just, you have to be working forward, but you do need to know enough to imagine your world. But you can imagine your world first and go back. Everyone has, doesn't matter where, if you do it reverse order, yeah, but I do believe everything better be right. That's, the book doesn't need to be the way it is. Hi, Nathan. Hi. Uh, you speak about your own personal passions. It's really riveting. And then also identifying as a neurotic person. Hi. Hi. Um, did you find that the process of writing this book helped to dispel it or be perhaps part of an own personal therapeutic process or if it riled up these emotions or perhaps a combination? Oh, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Like the catharsis of writing. Mm -hmm. So two things, like, or 20 things, but about neuroses and writing, <laughs> I'm sure... Uh, your job is, to, the books only work if you recognize that your obligation is to story. So if a story, you want everyone to have a, like a, you want your book to end with a terrible fire and everybody's killed, but they end up at Six Flags, like riding the flume and then they have cotton candy, too bad. Listen to your, you do what the book wants. That's one obligation to story. You have your best line. You often have to cut your best line. It may be your best written line. If the book doesn't need it, it goes. And then like personally, you know, you may want to go out Friday night. Your book needs work. You write. Done deal. So on that note, I only function that I recognize it's very helpful for me to be like I fall away there's only the story my obligation is story point is I'm sure it's cathartic I'm sure it helps me it's not my business you know what I'm saying like that's a bonus that's a side bonus to story you know like that I really do feel like I understand my feelings about Israel better that wasn't my intent I wanted to tell this story and I learned obviously the drive is what drove me that way it helped me make sense of a lot of stuff that I can now talk to you about but yeah I don't I don't care about those nice side effects. The only si personal side effect I care about is 
Uh, if you're like a heroin addict and you clean, good for you, another day, keep going. But I'm saying if you get off it, I don't mean the addiction, I mean off the addiction. I'm saying if you were once a heroin addict, you'd probably wake up every day and say like, I want heroin, don't do it. But the two, my two like favorite things, if you don't do them for a week, you never want to do them again. Like the gym and writing. You get a week off, you're like, oh, who wants to write ever again? So back to the neurotic people, I've trained myself to make it that I'm only sane if I write. And that's a construct, but now it works. It takes years. But now I have to write to be happy, even if it often makes me unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there's a question right at the back there. It's just so everyone at the back can hear you. Hi, um, okay, yeah, you can hear me now. Um, thanks for your teeming optimism. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering about like your comment about South Africa and kind of like this idea of uh, wanting to be optimistic about being able to make peace but then what happens when you so you, you make that peace and like racism still exists there you know South Africa is not obviously like a perfect place after apartheid no. and so I'm wondering where you see like the after because oh. there's always something after and there you take yeah. me right to my gray space. That's the okay. point is the world the gray like space. yeah, like we're just moving, you're moving forward and you have to move in the right direction. But you bring me to the big thing which is people get scared. You know what I'm saying? So I think and it, you know, that's my point. You cannot believe in marriage equality. You can believe certain people shouldn't get married. I just think you're wrong. You can think I'm wrong, I think you're wrong, but you're also wrong. Everyone should be able to get married. But I'm saying, what I saw personally because of my personal eth not political, ethical beliefs like you know, should uh, and you know, should children not have health care and die so that people with like larger estates larger than ten million bucks don't pay taxes? That to me seems wrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying when we started in America, we make progress. You know what I'm saying? And they say like, oh, there's a person of color in the White House. People can marry everyone. Marriage equality, health care for all. I feel like that's is I think that's the forward evolution of society. Why have a society if we're not going to take care of each other and be nice to each other? And I feel like those things can be so scary that we shot back so far and have an openly white supremacist government, which I didn't, it's such a slingshot. And that works for my Israel thing, which is, because America's uh, young as, you know, this republic, you know, over there. But uh, I'm just saying that Israel, it's like a 2,000 year fight and I feel like we were so, cl I lived in Jerusalem then, that's what I can't let go to. Everyone wants their, to send their kids to school and have them walk home safe. You know what I'm saying? We have terror, peace for Paris and New York and all our great cities, you know what I'm saying? But that notion, like we were so close, we were really making peace and I think it scared certain people who don't like that so much that now we've lost 20 years and it'll probably be 50 or 100 but I'm like oh divide that into 2000 so I'm saying America's a couple of hundred years old hopefully you know hopefully Mueller's done next week I'm just saying yeah. that that notion we made progress as a society and then it scares certain people who don't want to see that kind of progress and then it goes back so I think the job is to just keep pushing forward there are certain obvious things that I think are beyond discussion which is you know as I say, healthcare. It's it's just it's inevitable. So we're gonna lose some ground, but you can't stop that because any feeling human being would want to be helped if they were ill by society. So yes, South Africa's great and yes, like Cape Town looks different than Joburg. I see you know, you see that stuff, but you know, we can I can only wish them well to move forward, to move ahead. That's a dead series. Should we take one more? <laughs> maybe I can get more depressing and then we'll maybe clap if I earned it. No, no, that's okay. Well, we can call it there. Okay, well, on which note, then, I th let's uh, knock it on the head there. It's not over yet, however, because we have stacks and stacks of dinner at the centre of the earth available at the till. Um, this isn't a misprint, by the way. This is a British edition. <laughs> that's um, funny. <laughs> and I'm sure Nathan will be happy to uh, to sign them for you, yeah. too. It is a, a truly wonderful book. I hope um, I hope that came across uh, both in, um, in the introduction and during our conversation. Um, it's really sort of narratively quite unlike anything um, I've read before and it really um, it, it draws you in much like a, much like a kind of a whirlpool I guess and, nice. uh, just sucking you down that's the image <laughs> <laughs> dragging you down with me uh, stick around have a glass of wine with us uh, get your book signed uh, so hopefully see many of you on, as possible on Thursday as well when we'll be joined by uh, two faces very familiar to a lot of you uh, Deborah Landau and John Freeman who will be reading uh, from their poetry collections for us, so do come along for that. Otherwise, please just join me one more time in giving it up for Nathan Englander. Yours and I thank for coming. Thank you, Adam, for being brilliant. <laughs>